Hello and welcome back to the STEM for Latest Crusade, all fellow Bond fans. This is another in my uh, on and off series of James Bond what ifs. These are various what if questions and scenarios that I have rattling around in my head or ideas I come up with that I try to then ponder over and, and think about uh, what, how could they have worked in a real world sense at the time and, and try to figure out uh, if it's a plausible what if scenario. So uh, today I want to talk about A License to Kill a little bit, which famously, or rather infamously, uh, did not do well in the summer of 1989, one of the most competitive film summer uh, slates of all time, if not arguably the most competitive. It was dumped out by MGM UA with a, to say a lackluster ad campaign does not even begin to describe it. I would describe it as a piss poor <laughs> marketing campaign. Uh, some people really hate the the main uh, poster artwork. Uh, it kind of it kind of grows on you. It's okay, but it's it's not really up to the the Bond standard. The teaser trailer is quite nice, and the main trailer is okay. Uh, but MGMUA was really suffering, and uh, they had already. Uh, held the film back in terms of uh, its production. They had kept the budget down. The film wound up having to move to Mexico and construct some of its own sets. So there were hurdles for the production to overcome, and uh, the film was not helped ultimately by a very lackluster release and just essentially being dumped out in the middle of what is quite possibly the most competitive summer that ever existed in cinematic history. So it was absolutely obliterated by Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade, and most particularly by Batman, uh, not to mention many other great films and huge hits of 1989, including the likes of Lethal Weapon 2. So the way it was released, License Kill didn't really stand a chance. And this time it didn't even have a popular group to do the title song for marketing purposes, as the previous two films had. They had great success with Duran Duran On a View to a Kill, which became a number one hit single in both the U.S. and the U.K. Uh, it remains still the highest charting Bond song of all time. Uh, then they tried again with Aha and the Living Daylights, which I think is a masterpiece of a song. Uh, Aha and John Barry did not get along very well. Uh, but it did not, uh, unfortunately, along with the film itself, uh, did not achieve the same level of success as the previous song had. Uh, again, I do think part of that is due to the way the film was sold and marketed. It was not given an extremely strong push because it was at MGM UA who were in consistent dire financial straits. And uh, the, the continual of destruction of MGM had started uh, really in the early 70s under Kirk Kerkorian. And once they swallowed up United Artists, uh, starting with Octopussy, it became increasingly difficult for the Bond films to continue well, as they usually had. So they became much more of a uh, about the built-in fan base and just generating a, a new Bond adventure, but they were not promoted with the same fanfare as United Artists originally promoted Bond films in the 60s and 70s. There was a different way and they were the way they were handled and they were not sold to the marketplace of the 1980s, especially in the late 80s. Uh, and by the time you get to License to Kill, it is just un unbelievable how the film is just completely dumped out and uh, the marketing made it look almost somewhat generic in places which is really unfortunate so um, as I've done uh, thinking about Bowie title songs and looking at the title songs and trying to figure out how License to Kill could have done better at the box office in 1989 what factors was it missing one of the key ones is there is no giant uh, popular artist of the time in terms of a giant name like Duran Duran and AHA were uh, to help sell the film and draw people in or get people to buy the soundtrack. So you have Gladys Knight doing the title song, which is another of the great Bond title songs, and I adore it. And this is not me saying anything against the title song, which again, I absolutely adore. And Gladys Knight is a legend in her own right. But when you when you look at you know, the success of You To A Kill had with Duran Duran, and even some of the success, even though it was a lot less, they had with AHA and The Living Daylights, you can't help but wonder why they perhaps didn't try to do something that wasn't another ballad, which is essentially the sort of fallback standard upon title songs, particularly in the 1980s. They were not 
you know, real uh, heavy sellers as, as soundtrack singles, or that they didn't move as many soundtracks as, say, the Duran Duran title song, which was not a ballad. So it's an interesting idea to sort of toy around with. And then you think, well, who could they have gotten at the time who has maybe a Bondian flavor around this time? There were different musical genres really opening up and becoming uh, having more and more chart success. And the more I thought about it, there's one particular name seemed quite obvious uh, because I think this is perhaps the group that is is right up there in the highest peaks of, of the list of artists that should have done a Bond song decades ago, if not the number one on that list. And that, of course, would be Depeche Mode, who were really exploding in terms of success. In 1987, they had Music for the Masses, which was an enormous success and is a phenomenal album. So... 1989 would be uh, the same year of release as the 101 live album and accompanying concert film, which depicted their massive success uh, around this time point. And they were also, uh, they, they were already working on what would become their most famous, biggest selling album that would be released the next year in 1990, which of course is Violator, which is why I have that behind me here. And Violator showcases a, a new sort of sound for the band, a, a, gr a growth from Music for the Masses. Uh, you know, pretty much most everyone considers it their best and most famous album. And it's, it's chock full of, you know, life-changing, amazingly great singles, of which uh, Personal Jesus was actually released before the album in 1989, which was the year License to Kill came out. Since they were already, you know, erupting in popularity, it would be a a slightly different sort of uh, style for the Bond songs to move into. It would be something contemporary and modern, but also could still have the requisite Bondian flavor. And Depeche Mode is all about darker themes, particularly on Violator. So uh, it's right in their wheelhouse. It seems like a match made in heaven that unfortunately has never happened. Uh, I think it's absolutely insane that Depeche Mode has not done a James Bond theme song. Uh, they still could do one. They still should do one. Um, I it's just one of those you think about it and you're like, why Why isn't that a thing? So just to consider something to try and uh, help License to Kill at the box office, you know, the easiest thing in the world is to have a, a big hit title song to help sell the film as they tried and did on the past two films. So it got me thinking, what if Depeche Mode did License to Kill's theme song? What would they have done? Uh, how would they have perhaps worked with Michael Kamen, who did the film score? Uh, you know, what what would that have been like? Uh, and obviously, it probably would have uh, sonically a lot to do with what they were doing on Violator, because that was the album they were making at the time. Uh, they actually spent um, the longest they had ever spent on an album uh, producing it and making it uh, up to that point on the, on the album. So they've been working on it for some time, but uh, you can't help but think if if maybe there were some other elements that didn't make it onto the album that could have been you know turned into a Bond song or uh, if we would have gotten a Bond song similar to something on Violator. So it's interesting food for thought. And I think of the artists that were around at the time who were you know, well known and popular or more on the up and coming and just reaching those levels of popularity side of things. I think Depeche Mode would have been a great fit. It's a darker film, of course, License to Kill. It was the first Bond film in the U.S. to have a PG-13 rating. Uh, it had censorship problems across the world. There are different edits of the film that were released in different territories. It's about Bond going rogue and Bond really dealing with his warring internal personal emotions and his human emotions getting the best of his uh, professional objectivity. And uh, that just seems like the perfect territory for Depeche Mode to tackle in a title song, uh, especially at this time when they had reached the, the uh, pre-Violator era when they were working on the album. So it's just an idea that once... Once that sparked in my brain, I, I couldn't I couldn't forget about it. And I started thinking about it more and more and more, and I realized how well it would fit thematically with what the film's about. Um, so I, I think in the idea of tr how do you make License to Kill a bigger hit at the box office, how do you advertise it better, um, you know, I think the easiest thing would be to try and get uh, a popular group of the time to do the theme song. And I think Depeche Mode would have been perfect. Um 
it's an, it's it's unfortunate that they didn't have a, a a bigger hit title song to sell the film, and the License to Kill theme song, you know, it it did some it had some chart success, but it was you know nowhere near the the previous two films in terms of success. And again, I absolutely adore the Gladys Knight song, so so don't get me wrong, you know, I absolutely adore it. Um, of course, the film did have another title song originally, uh, featuring Eric Clapton and Michael Kamen and Vic Flick, and unfortunately that was thrown out and uh, has never been heard as far as I'm aware. So that's another great um, you know Bond song I, we can only think about or read about. So that's that's unfortunately never been. Released. Least. I mean that that's that's a song I'd uh, I, I would metaphorically kill to hear you know uh, using the film's title but uh, it's interesting to think you know what what would have happened had they gone for a more uh, a more uh, popular group of the era and what Depeche Mode could have done with the James Bond song and again I think it's absolutely ridiculous they've never done one so uh, I, they again it, it's it should be a thing but unfortunately it isn't. Um, but that's just uh, another one of these James Bond what ifs that I just had rattling around in my brain that's sort of been percolating over over the past couple weeks. And uh, again, uh, trying to figure out License to Kill's uh, release and uh, could it have ever have done more at the box office in 1989 coming out in that summer? I, it's it's a hard uh, hard question to answer because all you can do are the what ifs you can just try and guess uh, because unfortunately it was just kind of dumped out there and it just got buried and did not get very good reviews and most critics didn't even bother to see it so uh, it, it it sort of got swept away by by the rest of the year and uh, eventually started getting forgotten to time until it was really rediscovered in the internet era as the sort of dark uh almost uh, breaking the formula Bond film or the Bond film that uh, went off the rails and did its own thing, which is true. That's what that's what License to Kill is. Um, how successful that is d- depends on, you know, the individual audience member. Uh, the, the, the reactions to the film are extremely varied. Some people absolutely adore it. Some people can't stand it. Uh, some people are, are sort of in the middle. So, so there's a great range of response. But I think it's interesting to think what would have happened if they had had a uh, extremely popular group of the time do the title song, would that have affected the box office any, and how that how that would have maybe worked with the Michael Kamen score. It's also important to note that even the Patti LaBelle uh, in title ballad, If You Ask Me To, did not do well on the charts, sort of got forgotten, and then it was covered by Celine Dion a few years later in the early 90s and became a major hit, so... Um, it could simply be all down to the absolutely piss poor marketing of the film. And I use that term uh, because it, that's literally how badly the film was just dumped out. Uh, it, it was literally just thrown out in one of the most competitive summers the film world has ever seen. So I do think in, 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 the, in, in the grand scheme of things, having a more visible popular charting title song would have helped as it did on the previous two films and i think this would be the perfect entry point for depeche mode i think they would have been a phenomenal choice for the timothy dalton era and in fact in my own sort of dream scenario third dalton film that never happened uh, if if i am piecing it together and doing it uh, i would have depeche mode doing the title song and say 91 for the unmade third dalton film that we never got i, I felt i feel they were they are would be such a perfect fit, particularly for this era of Bond, and with their level of success at the time, it would have also helped to literally sell the film. So that's this particular James Bond what if. What if Depeche Mode did the title song for License to Kill in 1989, just before the release of Violator? So uh, as always, to all Bond fans everywhere, I hope this is a good sort of uh, point of discussion. Please leave any comments below with your thoughts or uh, thoughts about Depeche Mode ever doing a a Bond song or uh, what if they had done a different film's title song. Uh, Again, I still think it's a crime that they've not done one. (laughs) Uh, I still think that 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 can happen and should happen, but uh, it just hasn't yet. So as always, thanks ever so much for watching and always, 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 Keep the James Bond flag flying and keep bonding.